Hi, everyone. To conclude today's agenda, I am pleased to introduce the last talk held by the Zen storyteller, Emily Valls. Emily Valls, a part of being a unicorn believer, you will, which you will need to explain us further later, uh, she is a director and artist who creates multi-sensory experiences that foster curiosity and wonder in the everyday. Best known for her work at the intersection of food, technology, and senses, she funded the first food design studio at Pratt Institute and teaches experience design at the School of Visual Art Products at, uh, of Design, a uh, master program in New York. Feel welcomed. The mic is yours, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, sitting in my childhood home right now, so it's a really uh, exciting moment to reflect on my own work and what brought me here. So today I want to share with you a presentation, and I'll talk over it, um, about what has fueled my own creativity and what some kind of learnings are, I think, for all of us who work in this industry, how we might use food as a medium, uh, both for creativity and imagination. So if we can share the screen that I have right here alongside my great big head, which I think is going to be a little smaller soon. Um, I'm calling this creative fuel. You can also find uh, my name, my social media handle there at the bottom. It's just at Emily Baltz. And to kick us off today in the short time that we have together, I wanted to first say hello. Here's a photograph of me that's a much better vision of what I look like right now. But I think it stands for all the things that I'm really interested in, which are how we fuel radical imagination and new visions of our future humanity through uh, the material and experience of food. Now, my own work, I've been practicing in the world of food and design for the last 15 years. And my work spans a collection of images that you see here, everything from uh, immersive interactive dining experiences to speculative objects, as well as cookbooks um, and art books that you see here pictured in the middle, the Love Food book being one of the, the, the publications that I'll talk to you a little bit about today. Um, I work and believe in the realm of play. I think that food is one of the greatest materials for allowing us to feel together, move together and play together. And mostly what the, my little role here on earth, I like to use this material of food to explore radical new ways to fuel our humanness. Uh, I'm interested in the future because I'm interested in the present. I'm interested in how we experience our lives as people and what that might mean. And in doing so in my own practice, I, as I said, use food as both material and metaphor for attempting to design new experiences on earth. Now, Presently on this earth, I'm right here <laughs> in North America, just outside of Chicago. For the last 20 years, I've lived and worked in New York City. Uh, as for many of us, the pandemic has rearranged our lives. And so my family and I are a little bit of nomads right now, moving between Montreal, New York, and presently outside of Chicago, where we're visiting my mom. So you get a little peek into my personal life. Uh, but presently, this is, my, this is my location on Spaceship Earth. And while we've been moving around, I also have a, a three-year-old son. His name is Lucian. And one of the books that we've been reading is this. It's this wonderful book by Oliver Jeffers. I recommend it to everyone, toddlers and adults, called Here We Are, Notes for Living on Planet Earth. And I want to share, share this book with you today because it also speaks to what I'm interested in exploring in my own work. And I think what we can use food um, as a material for as well. Now in this book, it talks about uh, you know, who we are as people, what the earth is, what the universe is. And two main themes come out of this book, which relate to my own personal and professional practice. One is that um, on our planet, there are people and one people is a person. And to be a person, you have a body. So a lot of my work implicates the human body. And I'm interested in food for that reason, because it is our only multi-sensory material on earth. And as all of you know, when we eat, we don't just taste. We hear, we smell, we feel, we taste. It's really a, a symphony of the senses, which implicates our body in ways that other materials don't. And so I think that's one of the primary reasons that food is such an interesting material to explore humanity through, because it is our only material that truly implicates our entire body, our entire perceptual field. Um, 
the other part of being on earth, which uh, Oliver Jeffers states so poetically and so simply, is, uh, is this, the most important thing for people to remember here on earth is to eat, drink, and stay warm. And obviously that relates directly to Maslow's famous hierarchy of needs and implicates this base layer for all of us humans that is our physiological need to stay alive. And we do that primarily through eating, through drinking, through staying safe in shelters. But of course, as you all know, Maslow also goes on and extrapolates on this base human need with the rest of the hierarchy of the human experience from safety to love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization. And I'm sure throughout this conference, food is being used as a lens onto all of these different parts of our human experience. How we use food as a ritual to create a sense of belonging. How we even use it now more than ever, I think, in social media to create a sense of self-esteem, personal branding, or you know, the top of the pyramid, creativity and imagination, where hopefully as a planet, we can bring more and more people to flourish within this space. So I've always found this to be a, a fascinating system and to look at it through the lens of food also allows us to think about how we use food to fulfill and fuel our entire human experience. And in that lens, as I said early on, food for me has become a fuel, a fuel for catalyzing all the different layers of human experience, for empowering us, um, for nourishing us, for exciting us and moving us forward as people. And I, for, the, for um, the sake of this presentation, I wanted to also share with you how food has become fuel for my own health, my own creativity and my own imagination hopefully to spark some new inroads into our profession and to think about how food might be used more as an ingredient and instead as a material and as a medium. This investigation personally started, uh, gosh, more than 15 years ago now. I studied at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Um, originally, I actually have a degree in screenwriting and contemporary dance. I worked for about five years in film and photography production. And then I went back to school, really enthralled by the field of design, having discovered it um, and decided to study how we make things and as well as how people engage with things. And so industrial design was a perfect fit for that. At that time, food wasn't really used as a material for design. Um, so I did a thesis, which is pictured here, open wide, the effect of cultural, cultural mythology on the American appetite specifically exploring how food was used as a medium and material for designing consumption habits in the United States. Uh, this thesis lies, I think, dormant in the Pratt Institute Library. It's a very early piece of work, a very, very early stab at trying to understand how food was used, not just as a material for design, but also as a material for human behavior. And that really springboarded my own career uh, in the United States, which primarily I have lived and worked for the past uh, 40 some years now. And I will share with you how this started to evolve. So these are a variety both of personal and professional projects that have fueled this investigation along the way, trying to better understand how food can be a medium for behavior as well as a point of entry into all different parts of the human experience. Um, post this thesis, I actually ended up working in between hospitality, uh, pictured here is a restaurant called Suba that I worked in uh, as a cocktail waitress while doing my master's thesis. I was, I suppose, doing practical application without even knowing it, alongside working as an industrial designer. So post-graduation, I went to Paris and I worked for Arik Levy, the designer pictured here, working very classically um, across the spectrum of furniture, uh, decorative objects, as well as even some timepieces, cell phones, etc. So it was a real uh, portfolio of experience that I came out of these postgraduate years with. And I came back to the US in 2008 and really wanted to apply what I had learned both in industrial design in terms of uh, human behavior research, as well as form making and installed uh, this very early piece uh, that was really a personal practice, trying to look backwards and say, okay, if I now am ready uh, to, to practice as a food designer, where do I start? What do I do? 
And as any good designer does, I think you first do a bit of research. So I wanted to see how people thought of food. And I installed uh, a piece that specifically looked at food as a vehicle for memory and for nostalgia uh, in the contemporary landscape. And I installed this very DIY sound booth, which I called a food bank. And I think for anyone out here who is a student or an early practitioner, I wanted to share this project because it is super scrappy. I bought an armoire, as you see here, uh, off the internet, off of Craigslist in New York City, if you know what that is. It's sort of like a, almost a barter system now. Uh, lugged it up into my apartment, scraped half of it, scraped the purple paint off half of it, uh, and spent more time devising a way for people to go in and share their favorite food memories. So this was installed in a gallery in Brooklyn and you would go inside and you see a little switch in the center of the armor that you would flick on, a light would come on that would mean recording. And I asked people to donate their best food memories, their favorite food memories, to give a voice to food. And the goal of this food bank was to create an oral archive of food memories that were then logged online in an online archive and sorted not through dishes or ingredients, but through time, place, and event. And in that sense, I wanted to start expanding the lexicon of food, how food could be thought of, used, um, and reimagined as experience instead of just ingredient or dish. So at that time in 2008, as we're sort of beginning to think about the world of experience design, this was a way for me to try to give form and language to food in another way. Thereafter, obviously from that, you start to understand that food plays such a, a fundamental role in culture as my thesis exploration had done. And obviously the food bank had really given voice to. Uh, the year after that, I in between had started to make some of my own work. I was actually working in a design studio at the time, trying to understand, you know, how would I use this personal passion as my own professional vehicle? And while I was in this job, I was taking the office pantry snacks, the free office snacks that we had, and uh, making these kind of gourmet recipes with it. Now, junk food, I do believe, is one of uh, the cultural cuisines that America can own. <laughs> it was truly invented here, uh, marketed here, imagined here. And in doing so, I wanted to explore what else it could do. My own cultural background is half American. And so I took the office pantry snacks, and I remade uh, these gastronomic recipes I had grown up with as a child, specifically French gastronomic recipes, and put them online. Uh, a friend of mine ran Core 77, which is a great industrial design website, if you don't know it, and was doing this special called Hack to Work. And so I made this little blog post that was called Office Snack Gourmet, How to Turn Junk Food into Something More made things like truffled berry pradine purses using fruit roll-ups, uh, something called a Reese's peanut butter candy, and then crushed potato chips. Really what it ended up being was a material study as I started to explore the materiality of all of these industrial foodstuffs and then try to recreate the flavor of these gastronomic recipes I had grown up with that my French mother would continue to make in America. So it was both a personal investigation as well as a bit of design validation. This went online, uh, it got a little bit of press as I started to continue kind of digging into all of these, the kind of the panoply of, of great junk food. And I got a call from uh, a book publisher, literally a phone call in 2008, if you can believe that, who said, we found your article online. We've always wanted to make a book called Junk Foodie, uh, exploring how junk food could be made into gourmet recipes. And so I got a book deal and it became Junk Foodie, 51 Delicious Recipes for the Lowbrow Gourmand. And through that process, I ended up making uh, recipes that were divided into breakfasts, lunches, dinners, amuse-bouche, desserts, and cocktails, and devised a series of techniques, quote-unquote culinary techniques, that included the smash that you see pictured here and these potato chip bags where you can open a small potato chip bag, just a little bit at the top, and then smash it violently with your hands to create a crunchy powder flavored either in Cool Ranch, Red Hot, et cetera, et cetera, all the potato chip flavors you could imagine. I also discovered that the Jelly Belly, which you see here is like a little uh, jelly bean candy, really was the bouillon cube of junk food. <laughs> 
flavors otherwise unknown in junk food, uh, exotic pina colada flavors, jalapeno peppers, could be chopped very finely and mixed in to create a sense of an exotic palette in pretty much what you see here is a beige orange landscape of flavor. This was pure delight. I went around and really um, worked heads down for about four months doing recipe development as well as photography for this entire book. You see my photographs pictured here. This is one of my favorite recipes called the Twinkie Napoleon. It uses a Twinkie, which is sort of an extruded industrial cake that is filled with pastry cream. Famously, um, this industrial food product was deemed as non-food by J. Edgar Hoover years and years ago when it came out in the 50s uh, because it could last for 250 years due to the stabilizers in it. So knowing that, I was interested in exploring you know, how might this material respond to manipulation. And so you can cut a Twinkie in half, reserve the cream, and then reconstitute the cake into dough and then roll it out very finely, just like you would with a puff pastry. And the Napoleon, if you don't know it, is a wonderful puff pastry, classic French pastry, puff pastry and pastry cream layered on top of each other. And when you bite into it, it has a sort of sweet and salty, crunchy and squishy mouth experience. And I was able to recreate this using a reconstituted uh, Twinkie cake rolled into fine dough, put some of the reserved cream back into it, add a little bit of smashed potato chip, layer and repeat. And when you put this in your mouth, you have a verisimilitude of a French pastry remade using only American junk food. So this was the provocation for this work that actually was published by a major American publisher. I went on to make things like the Circus Peanut Aron, a riff on the macaron, which you see here on the right-hand side, made with something called a Circus Peanut Candy, with the inside of a Mounds bar, which is kind of a coconut candy bar, mixed with Fun Dip, which is like a citric acid sugar uh, treat for children, next to a uh, very jelly belly clafouti, which is a, an industrial pie crust remixed with industrial pudding and very, very jelly bellies uh, kind of clotted into this to remake the experience of a clafouti. Uh, it went on and on. This book still exists, I believe, on Amazon for a very cheap price and is found in truck stops across America. <laughs> I also went on tour with it. I did some television appearances and I also then started to do workshops so people could come to these workshops and remake, kind of hack the industrial food culture and make their own recipes that would reimagine the foodstuffs of the everyday into their own creativity, their own personal expression, their own kind of oat cuisine. So I share this book because it really started as personal play and actually became a piece of professional practice that launched my career in food design. So I quit my agency job at that time and started to explore more and more this, this emerging world of food design. The projects that I'll share here are a bit in nonlinear format, but kind of uh, continue in the narrative of this. So a big part also of my own creativity and I think my own fuel in using food as a material for experimentation and for design is the way that it involves our body. I talked about this early on with this example of the kids book that we're reading, but food, which I think is such a wonderful experience is because it obviously implicates our body and our movement. Trained as a dancer, this is something that I've always been passionate about. Um, in kind of waking up our creativity, how do we use our body? How is our body implicated in this? And I think that in food experience, what's always stunning to me is that we really haven't changed much in the Western world how we eat. We sit at right angles, we use cutlery. Um, over the last centuries, that really hasn't changed our right angle way of living other than eating on the go. So I started to explore this, and this is a project um, that proposed a cutlery list plateless, tableware-less dinner. It is served completely uh, flat on a large white canvas around which guests gather. And as you see here, instead of uh, cutlery and dishes, I would say there is choreography that is asked of people. So guests sit down, they perform a ritual hand washing and are asked to sit with their hands up. And what happens is that the service happens on them. And so small bites of food are placed in front of them. As you see here, sauce is dribbled, drizzled over their hands. And uh, that is the opening act 
have you the opening movement for this dinner, which is called Traces. You'll see why shortly I named it this. And as you can imagine, if all of you are sitting here, you know, in front of your computers, if you would just do this and turn your hands up with me. That gesture asks a lot of us. We actually don't experience the world very often palms open. We do it often in spirituality, in meditation. Um, it suggests a certain vulnerability. It asks us to be open. That's why throughout time, most spiritual acts in one form or another require us to do this. And so this, though a very simple gesture, is actually a provocative act as well, asking people to change their behavior, to change their body positions, and not only here, right, change the way that they eat. And so with this simple gesture, and then you add sauce on top of it, well, suddenly you know that there's nothing left to do in this meal, then ah, you can't get rid of that sauce unless ah, you lick it. And so in this simple gesture, we break all the codes all of the rules of eating. Um, I work in this way because I believe that provocation can also be an invitation to curiosity. And this dinner is designed in such a way to provoke people to eat in a very different way, to use their hands. The dishes are designed to be ripped, dipped, shared. It is a communal meal. And in interacting with this food, what happens is that each of the dishes is also highly colored. And by the end of the meal, we start to see the traces of our interactions, the traces of our communication, the traces of our consumption that end up into a beautiful, abstract, highly colored, edible canvas by the end. So in and of itself, the act of eating becomes the medium for a, a piece of artwork, a traditional canvas that is the traces of our food experience. Uh, this obviously means something quite different in today's landscape of, uh, of the COVID reality. And so I share this with also a bit of nostalgia and a, and a hope that we can return to this kind of embodied eating as people. Within that, uh, as you can hear, probably a lot of my language borrows from, from words uh, that often perhaps more appear within performance uh, and choreography, as you see here. My background as a dancer highly informs the way that I approach the world. And traces really kind of laid a foundation for that, obviously in gesture and in movement, how we might re-choreograph the act of eating. I also, as an industrial designer, think a lot about the objects. I call them props for eating. One of the main props of our eating are tables. Um, we obviously use them as the stage for the daily dramas of our lives, as the, as the great American designer Russell Wright called the table. And this, uh, I wanted to explore this idea, how maybe the stage for our dining could be redesigned to create new choreographies of eating, new experiences of eating. So what you see here is a dinner called Discourse. This was commissioned by the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center in Troy, New York which is um, an avant-garde center that explores the boundaries of performance. And specifically, this meal was designed for the premiere of a choreographer named Ralph Lemond, who very literally explores the boundaries of theater and the boundaries of dance. And so taking his practice into consideration, I wanted to explore the boundaries of the table. So what you see here is a spandex table. It has seats for 40, um, these are 40 performance art curators that were invited to this. The chairs are stretched in spandex, the table is stretched in spandex. So when you sit at this, you don't encounter a hard surface. You know, if you're at your desk right now, you can kind of put your elbows down and push against it and feel the resistance that a surface gives you. This table does not do that. In fact, it does quite the opposite. You sit in it and you kind of squish. If I was on stage right now, I would do a little dance for you to show you what that looks and feels like. Uh, your elbows sink into it. The table holds you. And in doing so, we start to have a really different relationship to the act of eating. You know, it becomes responsive, it becomes playful. And as you see here, there are some peaks and there are some valleys. The peaks on the upper right hand side is a stable surface on which glass row is put. We still haven't solved how else to contain liquid. <laughs> so we have some peaks that are stable, uh, stable areas to hold wine, water, refreshments. And then these valleys, which you see right in front of this guest, are resilient. So uh, the secret behind this, I'll tell all of you, is actually it's just a series of mixing bowls, concave and convex, over which spandex is stretched. 
And so as the food is plated, it's served classically with weight stab, um, it lands in these concavities. And so what it does is it begins to bounce. And so you have a really playful experience with what you're eating where the food actually, in some ways, begins to perform for you, inversing this relationship of diner to dish, right? Guest and performer and explores the boundaries of what we think of as food, as performance, as consumption, and the role that we play in that um, with the stuffs of our everyday. So this for me uh, lays a groundwork also for exploring something that comes, I think, wrapped up in all of our eating experiences. We have the way that we interact with food, the way that the objects interact with us. And those all add, into, add up into this, I would say, uh, experience of storytelling that food at its best makes us feel. And so throughout this work, I'm always considering, you know, where do we add provocation? Where do we add comfort? Mostly, how do we help people feel together? It's something that I find so essential, even more in contemporary life, as our digital devices take us further from each other and from our physical experience. How might food bring us together physically in a feeling? And um, obviously, there is no more enigmatic feeling than um, the experience of love. So from, I was interested in how food and love uh, could relate to each other. And so in 2014, I embarked on this adventure and asked 15 different chefs and mixologists to share with me their definition of love in food and drink. And uh, I went around the world from Bali to Belgium and got to work with some of my own heroes in cuisine and uh, photographed and wrote this book, The Love Food Book, which is published in French. It's called Le Libertinage Gourmand. If you speak French, uh, you know that that is a salacious subtitle <laughs> that deconstructs the emotion of love through sweet, salty, and cocktail. And uh, some of the stories that came out of that, I think, are so beautifully human and show the diversity of how we experience emotion as people and the celebration therein. So I'll share with a, a few of those today. The first one um, being a story about sacrifice. So this is where it begins. I uh, had the great honor of being able to work with Kobe Deschamers, if you know him. He had this wonderful restaurant now closed in Belgium called Indewolf. And I went to go meet Kobe and asked him, you know, what is your definition of love? He put down these two pigeons, uh, a provocative image nonetheless. <laughs> sort of shocked, I looked at this and said, Kobe, what, what are you trying to say here? And he said, you know, I grew up in this farm. Indewolf was the farm in which he had grown up as a child. And uh, when he was little, they would source all of their food from around them, which he still did to that day. That was one of the principles of Indewolf. And he said, I was alone as a kid here, and I really didn't have any friends, but I had these two pigeons who were my friends, and I named them, and they would come and visit me every day, and they sort of became the emotional relationship in his life. And one day, he said, my mother came to me, and she said, Kobe, we have to kill the pigeons. And he said, why? And she said, we have to eat. And so for him, his early definition of love implicated sacrifice. And it is such a beautiful, tender story when you can think of it through the mind of a child, especially. And Kobe created this dish in honor of that, which is a fermented pigeon dish. So he would take those pigeons, stuff them with hay, allow them to ferment over several weeks, and then infuse a hay butter and cook this fermented pigeon meat in a hay butter. And if you know about fermentation, especially and pigeon meat, pigeon meat being quite tough, the fermentation would soften it, but also create this sort of bitter, rancid quality to it. When cooked in butter, would add a sweet umaminess to it. And so when you taste this dish, I wish we had taste-o-vision. Um, it's one of the most tender experiences that I've ever had in eating, because you were able to taste this kind of bitter, sweet love that Kobe had felt for these creatures really a translation of emotion between two people who would have never met, who would have never talked about this, but a way for us to connect through a dish um, in a very vulnerable space, I think. And this became one of the beauties of doing this book. You know, I went then on to Chicago 
where at the time, um, Omaro Cantu, rest in peace, had a beautiful restaurant called Motu. And Omaro, if you know about him, was one of the early pioneers of molecular gastronomy in the US um, and developed this dish, which he defined as his experience of love. Now this is a log that is served to you. And uh, what you see here are microbe beans, tapioca maltodextrin, like all sorts of little scones, these things that look like worms, like tiny, tiny root vegetables. And you are immediately forced to, to look very closely at this dish, as well as taste it very, very carefully. You know, it's little powders, little microgreens, everything becomes very small. Your experience of eating is focus. And he said, this for me is love. It's about discovery, because if you don't look closely, you might miss it. So it was stories like this that really uh, started to fuel my imagination and also add to my own practice as I started to meet these incredible chefs and practitioners who thought about food as emotion and food as storytelling. And I think that's something that all of us share in this field is that how can it also become a vehicle for sharing feelings, for connecting us as people? And I always wonder and ask this of all of us is what are the other stories that we might need to tell in this world and how might our emotions help move us through this in a space of collective action, but also of collective experience, which food does so well. Another emotion that I think we face probably more than ever now in culture is uh, the emotion of risk. Early on, as humans, when we would discover a new food stuff, there was obviously always a risk of death. Any new food that we might taste has the potential to be our demise. Um, and that I think can expand metaphorically and concretely into all areas of our life. It's an emotion that I am personally interested in experiencing because I think that as we experience risk safely as people, we grow in very beautiful ways. And so this was an emotion that I was interested in exploring. And at the time of making the Love Food book, I was also the creative director at the Museum of Sex in New York. I was creative director from 2011 to 2014. And as part of my tenure there, one of um, my tasks was to open food and beverage for them. And so in 2014, uh, I worked alongside the team and some wonderful chefs and interior architects uh, to open a bar and restaurant called Play, which you see pictured here. It would transform from day into night um, and was flanked. You see a back bar that was actually a, an original bar from 19th century England brought in to become this kind of like apothecary space. And in the front of it was uh, a series of booths and small intimate spaces set up like the stacks of a library. If uh, I think in American mythology in college, you know, salacious things would always happen in the stacks of a library. So this was a way to bring intimacy as well as a little bit of provocative play um, and mythology to the space. And so we opened play and one of the unique things about that bar is that we were able to design the entirety around this kind of emotion of risk of provocation and also treat the menu in such a way. And so I was in charge of curating the food experience along with uh, Ben Roche, who had actually come from Moto, who was our opening chef in residence. And we designed this menu that looked into jewel tones of color, um, materiality and texture almost before flavor. So things that would crunch, things that would ooze, things that would jiggle, things that would tickle in our mouth to really explore the sensation of sexuality in the safety of a public restaurant. So how could we address the physical body, the physical experience and offer people a sense of risk in public? This was one of the tenets of play. I also had uh, the great joy of alongside the food and beverage menu, creating a performance art cocktail menu. You see here pictured um, a cocktail called Paradoilia. So this I curated in collaboration with different artists. And so I came up with this kind of structure that would explore, as you see from past work coming back here, the gestures of intimacy, gestures that were shared between intimacy and eating. So this cocktail menu was curated around gestures of licking, sucking, biting, and sniffing. What you see here pictured is the lickable cocktail, as said, called Paradolia. It is a black ribbed porcelain plate designed in collaboration with a wonderful artist named Bart Hess. 
H-E-S-S, -S, who is a Dutch artist, uh, really incredibly talented in material exploration, uh, kind of avant-garde textiles, and how that addresses the human body. And so Bart had this amazing alien textile. And so we saw this and thought, oh, what if we made it into a play? And what if it became an experience that was purely tactile? And so with this cocktail, as you see a close up here, you're served a vial of thickened nigori sake flavored with yuzu. So you get this kind of like milky, creamy, but exotic flavor experience that is placed in front of you and the waiter serves it. And so there is nothing left to do because this plate is designed to be so shallow. If you were to pick it up, it would spill everywhere. There is nothing left for you to do than lean over and lick it. Uh, we can all imagine what that creates in us. You can even maybe further imagine what it means to do this in public space. So not only is this just, you know, a provocative, sensual experience for a guest, but also one of the things that I was interested in was how it would animate the public space. Because what would happen is if multiple of these cocktails were ordered within the bar space, what you would see were people sort of bobbing and weaving, licking what appeared almost to be the table, and then exploding usually into laughter. And that reaction created this sense of play, but it also created permission to experience something kind of risky in the public space and how food became a medium and a fuel for that kind of permission is something that to this day I still feel quite proud of um, and quite excited about the possibilities for what that might mean for us as people and our emotional experience. You've heard the word play several times I'm sure so far um, and so the last few projects that I want to share with you today deal quite directly with this. So licking became a theme. I was really interested in it for a while. I developed uh, thereafter as interactive technology became more and more accessible. Um, what you see here, it's called Lickestra, the Lickable Ice Cream Orchestra. So this is a series of rapid prototyped ice cream cones inside of which are hidden capacitive sensors. Capacitive sensors measure resistance. And ice cream is dropped into each of them. Um, the original uh, insulation of it is pictured here as a series sort of, of gallery pedestal busts. Guests are invited to pop into these gallery pedestals, kind of a riff on like the formality of a classic bust, and instead are asked to lick. It's kind of the only thing you can do. You can't use your arms, as you see here. And with each lick, your lick triggers uh, a musical interaction. And so I'll play with the, I'll play for you a little uh, sample of what that looks like here. see all of your faces, usually uh, that project leaves everyone sort of laughing and slightly uncomfortable, <laughs> but has gone on to be uh, many iterations actually around the world from music festivals to galleries, and really is, I think, a vehicle for play, as you see quite literally, asking ourselves how food can be an instrument for new kind of behaviors together. And presently, this is what I'm most interested in, is how we can start to use new media and new technologies as a new ingredient in our perception of food experience. So uh, I, this is a, a more recent project that actually takes a pretty analog point of entry into that at the same time. Uh, and it was a dinner that was done in collaboration with the brand Target for the TED Festival, the last time it was in real life. This was installed in Vancouver in 2019 and is Target's design dinner. And so uh, the theme that year was perception. How might we change perception? And so what I designed for them was a menu that dealt with our perception of eating in the simplest way possible. So I played with materials. You saw, you see here a, a, a transparent gazpacho. So this is a clarified tomato water over a deconstructed gazpacho. 
on top of which were a series of words. Alongside the table, eat your joy was placed in different seats. So it was kind of a collective sentence that was read as a first statement into the experience. Next came um, a question around oh, how we might perceive food as art. And so I designed this asparagus paintbrush, which was served alongside an artistic canvas of, uh, of salmon. And as you see here, different edible food purees that created a question also, where might we find our joy? Where is the art in the everyday? And finally um, ended with this. So this, as you see here, is uh, an apple pie. So it is a verisimilitude of a truly beautiful, almost realistic apple, which is a, um, a white chocolate exterior. And when you attempt to break into it, you get this beautiful apple cream that is inside set atop of a sable, um, of kind of a graham cracker sable underneath, which creates the sense of eating an apple pie. So these were exploring perception and how we might use the design of food to create new perceptions, both in the way we understand food, the way that we think of the art of food, as well as the literal definition of food. You'll hear also, I think within this, um, some, some critique within the entire thing. As I said before, I'm interested in emotions of risk. I'm interested in provoking perception. And lately, I've also been interested in how uh, consumption also functions, I think, within this as a metaphor in our daily lives. So this project takes us radically away from the analog and, and embeds us truly in the digital. This is a performance project that I've created over the last several years with my collaborator. Here you see Klazin van de Zendeschlup a really incredible uh, Dutch artist who works at the intersection of interactive technology and culture. And you see me here on the right hand side. Now, uh, we perform in this. We are the, the supporting characters, though, of this show, which is called Eat Tech Kitchen. In this show, we perform the role of aliens who are observing Earth, obs observing human behavior and how we consume. And so through the lens of the alien, we create this world that is driven by the technological, fed by the industrial, but uses the lexicon of recipes to provoke people into new actions of consumption. So it is an absurd project. Our hero of, uh, of this show is a Google Home in which we have coded an interactive bot chef. So it's a very dumb piece of AI in which you interact um, by voice or by text, either by phone or with an actual Google Home, depending on the installation setup. And you have a question and answer with this bot that takes you through a series of personal provocations and results in a printed out recipe in which you use the ingredients of this Eat Tech Kitchen pantry. Uh, ridiculous things like remote controls, jelly beans, candy, you know, wires, batteries asks you to do things like plate your telephone and lick it. Uh, there are covers for the phones. We're not being that disgusting. <laughs> but using the material, uh, using the, the lexicon of recipes, as well as kind of the absurdity of the consumption culture that we are now in, provokes us into a new state of being, where we start to kind of conflate what we eat with what we consume, asking us also to critically reflect on our consumption habits and think about how they are fueling our behaviors. And so this is an ongoing project um, that can also be accessed online through my website and you can even play with a chef at home and try this out in a group. Uh, last but not least, I want to be a little sensitive to time here, um, is I think where I think food functions generally in my life also as a vehicle for storytelling. I think you heard this in my introduction. I like to think of food also as a vehicle for sensory storytelling. And so uh, this project here is a large scale gala that is a bit of a rewind. It was a project from 2014, but I think it thing to end with the circuit of the senses is installed at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha, Nebraska, um, under the curation of a wonderful practitioner, Amanda McDonald Crowley. And it takes guests through a series of four dishes, each set into a different immersive space. And each dish, instead of being inspired by an ingredient 
or even by a technique, is instead inspired by one of our five human senses. What you see pictured here is the dish that is the sense of sight. So guests would enter into this room and sit down around large format ice block tables, upon which they were served a hot dish of pho, the Vietnamese soup. The interesting thing um, along the development of this project, which I developed in Omaha with a series of, uh, of local producers, restaurateurs, and uh, performers, is that if you put anything hot on large format ice, the temperature differential creates movement. So the moment that this was served, the soup would start to spin, <laughs> which was just a beautiful visual trick, as you see here. While guests were eating over the course of this dish, the lights would also slowly start to fade to black. So your pupils would dilate. So you'd have a really interesting visual experience of attempting to eat this, attempting to see it, while also acclimating to a new visual environment, a constantly changing environment that asks us to sort of train our perception of sight, to work on what we see and how we see it. The next dish was served in this room, which is the sense of smell. Uh, guests entered into this room in complete darkness, led only by servers with flashlights, and were sat down at a black table. So you're really in the dark here, having to work on all of your senses to perceptually understand what's happening. And uh, the only lighting, as you see here, is flashlights. So waiters are all lighters. on the table, the table actually breathe. And what you see here is actually a cloud of dry ice. Um, the table was made of pegboard and underneath it responded to vibrations. So any vibration, any sense of touch on the table would puff up clouds of scented thyme vapor. Alongside that were served small mason jars of chaomushi infused with uh, rosemary and morels, chaomushi being a beautiful Japanese steamed egg custard. So having this real lightness and delicateness but being immersed really in an olfactory experience was how you ate this. They would then move on to the sense of sound. You see pictured here a series of grills that are actually Rubens tubes. Um, if you don't know what those are, those are these uh, kind of lines of fire that have a speaker on one end of them. So as beats were being pumped into this tube, the, uh, the line of fire would actually express the sound wave. And guests were invited to come up and roast marshmallows, lemongrass marshmallows, kind of a la American barbecue, and add them to these kimchi hot dogs. So a sort of extravagant, uh, almost Neanderthal neo barbecue. The last room um, is one of my favorites. This is the sense of touch. And guests were invited here down into uh, a large format dining table, operated by two hosts. You see here the back of one of the hosts. And the moment that guests sat down, uh, a kind of stunning and surprising thing would happen is that the table would serve you. <laughs> so in the crack of this table would appear human hands because inside of this table were hidden 15 dancers. And they performed the act of shaking hands, introducing themselves, and also serving the meal. The meal was hidden inside of the table. And so you see here uh, original greeting as the table would shake hands with all of the guests and then serve them uh, head on shrimp. So langoustines, salt baked, that guests would then have to rip open, use their hands, suck out. It became a very tactile, very playful experience as this table continued to almost try to touch you while you were touching your food. And uh, as you can see here, I think that one of the, the main tenets of my work, obviously, is that food is more than an ingredient and can be such a vehicle for storytelling, for imagination, for creativity, and hopefully fuel our world in a radically new way that perhaps we could never even imagine. So thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and maybe you can even see my face. Um, and thank Food Design Festival for having me. And hand it back off to Nicole. Thank you, Emily. It was awesome. Uh, very insp uh, inspired talk. And actually, you have a lot to, to share. We would uh, Now I have as many questions that I think that I will leave it for a coffee, digital coffee one day, um, because uh, it's uh, really nice. 
Um, this is a clear example of what food design is and can be, all the narratives that can happen. Um, it has been super organized. So I would like to conclude this session. Thanks everyone who joined or listened from somewhere in the globe. We are waiting for you tomorrow with the participation of Elisaba, Este, Fabio Paraseco, Lila Red Latinoamericana, The Food Design, Clara Diez, and many, many more. If today has been an intense day, you have four more days of Food Design Fest. So uh, we wait for all of you here. And now I'm going to shift to Spanish for all those who doesn't speak English. Uh, gracias por participar en el primer día del Food Design Festival. Os esperamos mañana a todos con la participación de Elisaba, Este, Fabio Parasecol y la red latinoamericana de Food Design, Clara Diez y muchos, muchos más. Thank you and take energies for tomorrow's session.